Hey everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you've clicked on this video, maybe that means you got Animal Crossing New Horizons for Christmas or you recently purchased it or maybe you've been playing it for a while and you just wanted to check out what I have to say because today we'll be talking about a few things that I wish I had known before I started playing Animal Crossing New Horizons. There's a few different categories that I like to talk about today, one of which includes actual game mechanics and then we have some decorating techniques and also just some useful things to know about the game. So without further ado, I would say let's go ahead and get started. When you first start the game of Animal Crossing New Horizons, you have to choose a map for your island. And for this process, it's quite useful to know that even though you only get four to choose from at the time, there's actually a lot more possibilities. And what you can do if none of those are to your liking is you can just close out the game and start fresh. Now, admittedly, you have to put your name in again and do your character customization, but just know that there are many more possibilities to choose from. And something that I also also wish I had known before playing is the few things that you should maybe pay attention to when choosing a map because there's a couple of things on an island map that you cannot change later on. First of all, the location of your resident services or your airport location. They can be very much in the center, they can be off to the left or right, and the resident services can be either very close to the airport or further back into the land. Now this pretty much just depends on what you have planned for the island and kind of your, your own preferences, but this is definitely something to take into consideration. Another thing is the peninsula and the pier. They can be either on the left or the right hand side and the peninsula can have a lot of different shapes starting from a very narrow shape to a, such a wide peninsula that you can even place an entire house on top of which can be quite fun. And for the pier there is usually like two different sizes. There's either a shorter or a longer one. Also the secret beach location which is that tiny little bit of beach at the back of your island can be very different and it can also be accessible from the starter map or not. Maybe this is also something you want to take into consideration. And while you can change the entire flow of the river as well as the cliff, the river mouths, so the point where the river meets the ocean, that can also not be changed. And there's like three different options you have here. The river mouth can either be in the east and south, in the west and south, or they can both be in the south. Again, all of those are absolutely fine to work with. It just comes down to your preference and it's quite a good thing to know at the start. Right from the start, you'll have to start placing houses and structures on the beach, which include your own house and the villager houses, nooks, ables, the museum, all of those. And one thing that I would have loved to know at the start is that it can be super handy to just put them on the beach. That doesn't always work, of course. Sometimes the structures are too big or the beach is just not wide enough. But this way, when you start decorating and landscaping, etc., they don't block any of your land and they're kind of out of the way for now and you can then easily implement them. However, with the new 2.0 update, moving houses is not as expensive anymore. So even if you don't put them on the beach, I feel like it should still be fine. But also very good to know. The next thing is something about villager hunting. So let me quickly explain what that even means. At some point during the tutorial phase, you will get a so-called Nook Mile ticket from Nook, with which you can go to the airport and then fly to the Nook Mile Islands. And if you have an open plot on your island, you can have up to 10 villagers. If you have an open plot, you can meet villagers on those islands and invite them to live on your island. And that essentially is called villager hunting. It's a very big thing in the community. People do it for hundreds and hundreds of tickets. One thing that I really recommend and that I don't think I knew right from the start is to get wasps and furniture on every single island. So take your net with you and shake the trees because each island usually has one wasp and one furniture piece. I would recommend to collect the wasps and either put them in your house storage or also just put them down on your island and then wait for the NPC Flick to come along because he will purchase all of your bugs for a lot more money than the nooklings would. And the furniture I would recommend just to put on your island. There doesn't need to be any structure with this and it doesn't matter how weird it looks, just put it out so that you can collect some points in order to get those three stars so you can unlock the landscaping and waterscaping features. Also during the tutorial phase, you will have to craft a campsite, which will then in the following days after actually have a campsite villager. This first ever campsite villager can always only be a smug. I'll talk about villager personalities in just a second, but 
you have to take this villager. Don't make the same mistake that I did and wait for a bunch of days for this villager to leave because unfortunately they won't. The game kind of wants to teach you how it works taking someone from the campsite. So you have to invite this person in, but don't worry, no matter how weird this villager is looking, you can move them out later and find a cute one instead. And I'd also like to mention DIYs. So DIYs that you essentially need to find and learn in order to be able to craft certain items and furniture pieces that you can then use for decorating your island, of course. And there's actually a lot of different ways that you can find DIYs I didn't know about at the very start. So first of all, over the course of a day, you can find three different villagers crafting an item. And if you go into their house and see them do that, talk to them and they'll give you the DIY recipe. You can also always find at least one message bottle on the beach containing a DIY. If you go and fly to those Nook Mile Islands, a lot of those will also hold a message bottle, so keep an eye out for those. There's also balloons flying over the island, which I definitely would recommend to shoot down, especially seasonal items. So let's say you're playing in winter, you probably will find a lot of the seasonal DIYs in those balloons. And last but not least, with the 2.0 update, they also included the Captain Island, which also always include a message bottle. So make sure to check all of those different locations so you can pick up as many of the DIYs as you can. All right, and next up, let's talk about villager personalities. There are eight different personalities in the game, four of them for female characters and four of them for male characters. The female ones are normal, sisterly, peppy, as well as snooty, and the male ones are lazy, cranky, smug, and jock. With the way the game starts, you will always have six of those personalities already on your island because the two villagers that you start the game with will always be a sisterly and a jock. The first three that move in after who you have to craft all those furniture pieces for will be normal, peppy, and lazy. And then the one from your campsite will always be a smug villager. So the only ones you still have to kind of find are snooty and cranky villagers. And these personalities determine a couple of different things, starting with the dialogue that they have. So what they say to you and what they say to each other but also what reactions they teach you. There are certain reactions in the game that your villagers teach you depending on your friendship level with them. There's four like basic reactions for each personality as well as a so-called best friend reaction. And in order to be able to get all of the different reactions in the game, you have to have all the personalities on your island. Plus the different personalities also determine uh, what type of recipes they'll craft in their houses. So it definitely makes sense to have all of the different eight personalities on your island and befriend those villagers because they're tied to all those things that you can unlock and collect. On top of the different personalities that a villager can have, there are also different hobbies. And in my opinion, if you think about the joy of the game, these might actually be more important because these hobbies determine the type of activities that a villager will do on your island. There are six different hobbies in total, education, fashion, fitness, music, nature, and play. With the education hobby, villagers will actually go around and inspect artwork, bugs, fossils, and all that kind of stuff. And they'll also oftentimes sit underneath a tree and read a book. The fashion hobby will just kind of make them stroll around your island in a fancy outfit with a pink bag. The fitness hobby might be my personal least favorite because villagers will oftentimes just stand around and work out and more often than not they have um, questionable outfits while doing so. The music hobby makes them stand around and sing and dance anywhere and everywhere. It's absolutely adorable. And my absolute favorite is when cranky villagers have this because the cranky villagers always have a very deep voice and their singing voice is the most adorable thing ever. Villagers with the nature hobby will chase butterflies, examine different flowers and trees and fossils while reading a book about those, and also they will water your flowers more often than others. And last but not least, my absolute favorite hobby, the play hobby, because with the play hobby, villagers will actually do those adorable zoomies and just run around everywhere on your island, whereas villagers that don't have the play hobby can only run around in the plaza. Now with this, let's talk about some decorating techniques. First of all, how to stunt a tree. So as you might've already noticed, trees have four different growth stages. After you plant them and they're that adorable little sapling, they grow into a small young, medium and large young tree before they're finally fully grown. If they all have enough space and you just let them be, they all grow to the maximum height. Now for decorating, however, it can be quite nice to have trees at different stages and different heights. Because let's say you have an entire forest, it can add a lot of depth 
and detail if not all of those trees are exactly the same height. And you can easily achieve these different heights by stunting a tree. And this works by planting a fruit sapling in any of the eight surrounding tiles. It can be directly in front or behind, it can be to the sides, or of course in a diagonal way. It just needs to be in one of those eight surrounding tiles and it can only be the five different fruit that grow on land. So coconuts do not count. So you can only use apples, cherries, oranges, peaches, and pears for this. But if you do succeed, you can travel as many days as you want and this tree will always stay in this group growth stage. Speaking of coconuts, let's actually talk about the beach for a second. The beach is kind of a piece of special land on your islands because not a lot of stuff grows on here. You can put all the different trees as a tiny little sapling on the beach, however they won't grow. So you could put a bamboo sapling or cedar sapling or any of those on the beach, but they won't grow past the sapling stage. Whereas coconut trees obviously will grow to any type of stage and you can also stunt those as previously described. The same counts for any shrubs. You can put shrub saplings on the beach, but they won't actually grow into a bush. You can plant any type of flower. However, again, those won't actually grow on the beach so if you go ahead and plant a flower bud they will actually stay like that you'd have to put them on the land let them bloom and then put them back on the beach but this can also be super handy because even if you run through flowers or you pluck flowers they will stay exactly that way on the beach no matter how many days you travel which can for one be super handy when it comes to decorating because you can use tons and tons of different types of greenery on the beach but also this can be super handy to just store your flowers on the beach and not have them breed and just completely clutter up your entire island. Weeds, however, do grow normally on the beach, so if you planted one and you don't have a lot of weeds on your island just yet, they can absolutely spawn a couple more and also grow to the highest kind of level. And having mentioned coconut trees, you might have already noticed that you cannot put coconut trees on the regular land, just on the grass. However, if you place down a, a tile of the sand pathing from the in-game type of path, you can still put coconut trees on land, which again can be super handy for decorating. And talking about the sand path, let's talk about custom designs and in-game pathing. So once you've reached the three stars and you've had that KK concert, you can unlock the landscaping and waterscaping as well as pathing licenses. Once you've done that, you can place down the so-called in-game path. There is a few different versions for this one, such as the dark dirt, the light dirt, cobblestone, all of that. And something good to know is that you can also put custom designs on top of this in-game path. Custom designs you can either make yourself or if you have the Nintendo Online subscription, you can download them using either the creator code that starts with an MA or the design code that starts with an MO. And you can put those on top of the in-game pathing, which can be an absolute game changer. However, something that I didn't figure out until quite a while later is that there is limitations to this. In order to show you this, we will be using just a solid blue design where Whereas one of them is actually solid, every single pixel is covered with the blue, and the other one has just one tiny little see-through pixel. And now, you might notice, if you place down the one with the see-through pixel, it perfectly adapts to the in-game pathing, which means it cuts off the edges, or if you even round corners or something like that, it'll always adapt and always fit perfectly. Whereas the other one that's just a solid color, and every pixel is covered, it just won't. It won't adapt and it'll just lay on top of it as a regular tile. So this is something to take into consideration. And also if you see certain creators have two of basically the same design, one of them has a see-through pixel, you kind of know where that's coming from and it also might help you choose the one you actually need. And with that, let's come to the last category, which is resources. First of all, I'd like to tell you about the Nintendo Switch Online app. You can set the so-called Nook link up from your starting screen, so the screen where villagers walk around with the logo on top. And then this app can be incredibly handy, especially when you meet up with other people. Because this app allows you to use the keyboard as well as emotions right from your phone, which makes it so much easier than the features on the Nintendo Switch. You can check out the catalog that you have or the island newspaper that they added with the 2.0 feature, which I think is super, super adorable. Something I would recommend is to collect your Nook points every day because with those you can actually order in-game items such as Tom Nook branded uh, toilet paper, which I mean, who doesn't want that, you know? And one of the best features is if you have finished your island and uploaded it so that other people can visit it with a dream address, you can actually see how many people have visited your island, which I think is uh, just super, super interesting. 
Another app that will change your life even more is acnh.guide. This should be available for iOS as well as the Google Play Store, and this has seriously transformed my life. I only found out about this after playing for one or two months, and I it just it ch it changed everything. It includes the entire catalog of everything that you could have in Animal Crossing, including all the furniture pieces, all clothing, recipes, songs, all type of bugs, fish, sea creatures, fossils, anything that you can collect and find and get in the game, you can find entire lists of this in this app. It's great to just browse through and kind of see what interests you and what you still have to get and that kind of stuff. But not only that, you can use this as your personal app because you can put in the villagers that currently live on your island. You can mark them off every single day after you've talked to them. You can put in your turnip prices. Um, you can put in whether you've collected all your fossils, hit all your rocks. There is a visitor tracker. It also tells you your entire collection progress. If you catch a bug or something, you can mark it as caught and also as donated. It tells you what from the Critterpedia you can catch at that specific point in time. And it's just, it's just absolutely great. You can, I think you can hear me be super excited about it. I would say download this, take a minute to just browse through everything and get used to it and have lots of fun. This helped me so, so much and I really hope that it does help you as well. And one more thing that I would like to mention is animalcrossing.fandom. This is not an app, but an online page. And I've been just visiting this unconsciously over the last year and a half, because every single time that I'm looking up a villager, which happens quite often, I just type into my search engine ACNH and then the name of that villager. So let's say we're looking up Flurry. I would type ACNH Flurry, and then I click on the animalcrossing.fandom link. And this is seriously so helpful because it gives you all the different information about a villager like their name, what type of personality they have, um, what animal type they are, and you can always click on these things and kind of further explore. You can also find out what their hobby is, as we previously talked about. I personally find that quite important. And if you scroll further down, you usually also see a picture of their house as well as their interior. And a fun fact, this page also shows you what they're called in other languages, which I always find super, super interesting. So I've just been using this a ton. I also sometimes just type in ACNH Cranky and and then you get to a list of all the different cranky villagers that there are in the game, etc., etc. And generally, of course, all the different information about this game is out there. You can either Google, there's tons and tons of amazing YouTube videos out there that explain the mechanics of the game further. And I just seriously would recommend to get involved in different types of communities as well, because that's what kept my joy of the game up so much is to engage with other people, get active either on Instagram, Twitter, and stream communities either here or on Twitch. I also actually do stream over on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Sparksby if you ever wanted to check that out. And it can be so much fun to get involved and engage with other people about this game. And then one final thing that I'd like to explain and mention, um, because I always get tons and tons of questions about this on stream, is the concept of treasure islands. You might hear this term from time to time because there are certain people who have a modded switch that they connect to a program that allows them to just input any type of item they could ever want. And a lot of those people have made treasure islands that are essentially just islands that are filled with stuff. And you can fly there and pick anything you like and take back home, which makes the decorating process and all of that so, so much easier. Oftentimes there will be treasure island streamers over on Twitch, or sometimes you can also find them on Instagram or Twitter. Usually these treasure islands have some type of rules. So if you ever stumble upon these islands and you do want to visit, make sure that you follow those and have lots of fun. And there you have it. That was a lot of information. I hope that that wasn't overwhelming and I hope that everything was understandable. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below. It's really always so much fun to interact with other people from the community. Community. And of course, if you've been playing this game for a while and you have something else that you would want to share, also please put that down in the comments below and let's kind of tell each other some of our favorite tips and tricks about this game. I really hope that this was helpful. If you liked the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. And then thank you all so, so, so much for watching. I hope you have an awesome, awesome time until I see you in the next video. Bye everyone.